How are you all doing this morning? I am well, thanks. Am I coming out of the speakers? No? I just want to make sure we get the recording for those people who aren't here. But I'll let DJ check that when he gets back in here. It's great to have you all here with us this morning as we finish up our, our Advent series um, this fine Christmas Eve morning. You can go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Last week we, we looked at and, and focused on Jesus being the light of the world, and we looked at uh, John's testimony to the light, the same testimony that we're now charged um, with giving once we've come to see the light. And so this morning, as you can see behind me here, that we're looking at this word rejoice. And so before we jump in and and look at that, I'd like to just open us with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that you've brought us here safely. And Lord, we just we just thank you for the opportunity that we have each week to, to come before you, to worship you through song, through prayer, through teaching. Lord, we know that, that you have a message in store for us this morning, and so we pray that our hearts and our minds would be softened and opened to what you have for us. Lord, I pray that what you, what you share with us this morning, I pray that we would um, take that with us, that you know, we would latch it onto ourselves and, and go with it, as opposed to just taking it in as knowledge and packing it away in our brains. Help us to, to live it out as well, Lord, and, and, to, and to be the people that you call us to be. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you and we pray this in your name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles and you turn to Luke chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 26. <clears throat> Luke 1 verse 26, it says, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so today we we begin after Elizabeth and Zechariah have learned that God is, is blessing them with a child in their old age, John the Baptist. So Elizabeth, it says that she keeps the pregnancy hidden, Um, And so we pick up here now at the sixth month of her pregnancy. And it says, During that time, while she's six months pregnant, the angel Gabriel visits Mary, a virgin, in Galilee at Nazareth. Mary's betrothed to Joseph, a man born into the line of David. So Luke starts us out with the details of who Mary is, brief as they may be, um, before bringing us into the message that God brings to them through Gabriel. <clears throat> and Gabriel comes to Mary and he says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And so right out of the gate, Gabriel addresses Mary with stature, with importance, and with value as he calls her the favored one. Right? Mary at this time is one of the least important people in her, in her day's society. She's a woman, which puts her lower than half of society by their standards at the time. Then it's put that she's a a young virgin, a woman with no husband for status, with no husband to to cling to, no children for importance, no children for future value, because right now, in their society, she's got no value to them, which sounds weird to say, right? Today, you kind of go, gosh, no value, but that's the way that the culture viewed it and so here she stands and this angel comes to her and calls her favored one naturally it doesn't exactly sit well with mary not in a bad way but she just kind of looks at herself and goes you're calling me the favored one she's not expecting the high praise that 
the angel Gabriel has and gives to her when he arrives. And so in verses 29 and 30, it continues that, that Mary's greatly troubled and tries to discern what the meeting could mean. Why is this angel Gabriel here? Presumably, Gabriel could see or understand that Mary was troubled by this. And he continues on and tells her not to be afraid, for she has found favor with God. Favor, how she probably... She probably wonders, favor how, she probably wonders, as Gabriel adds on. In verses 31 through 33, um, we see his continued message. He says that you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the most high. And he adds that Jesus will come from the line of David and will reign forevermore. See, Gabriel tells Mary that the baby that she's to give birth to is is Jesus, is the Messiah. What Gabriel speaks of is referring back to prophecies of old in Jewish teaching. In Isaiah 7.14 it says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. And then he continues explaining who Mary's child will be as he refers back to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, which read, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. See, now these prophecies, they came some 700 years prior to the events that we're reading of today. Right? Mary's receiving this message from Gabriel, and Gabriel is telling her all these things that she would have heard and known because in Jewish teaching, they would have gone through Isaiah. And they would have talked about what the prophet Isaiah had said. And so Mary would know and understand, wait a minute, you're talking about the Messiah. And so even after 700 plus years have passed, the message remains the same, except that now Gabriel is saying, this isn't something to come. This is now. This message is is here and now. We're no longer waiting, right? Advent is this whole um, understanding of we're waiting and we're anticipating the birth of Christ, right? And so this is looking at that first advent of, of really waiting for Christ, And so they understand, oh, wait a minute. Mary gets, you're talking about the Messiah. You're talking about the one that we've been waiting for and anticipating. The light is not only coming, the light has come, right? Jesus, Emmanuel, is to be born through the virgin Mary. And so let's read of how Mary reacts in verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. See, at this point, most people would react with a lot of shock, concern, maybe even worry, right? Even and especially in the world that we live in today, right? Where if you didn't want a pregnancy, you could just end it, as sad as that is today. And that was usually, that is usually a decision that's made because they go, oh, I'm too young, or oh, I'm not in the best financial situation. I'm just not ready to be a mom. Mary's 16. But look at her response to the calling of God. She looks at Gabriel and she asks, how? How is this going to be? She doesn't say, oh my gosh, I couldn't possibly be a mother. Why would you do this to me? Oh, please, Gabriel, don't allow that to be the case. She just says, how? She doesn't push back. She just wonders, okay, well, wait a minute. If this is the message that you have for me, Gabriel, how is this supposed to come about? How could I, a virgin, possibly carry the Son of God? 
Again, she could have said no. She could have argued, as I'd expect most 16-year-old girls to argue, that they're not ready for that, right? Now, granted, in her time, it was more common to have children much younger, but nevertheless, she could have tried to argue against Gabriel's message. And that's certainly the type of response that we would hear today. But Mary doesn't focus in on that. Instead, she simply wonders, how is that supposed to be? And in response, Gabriel explains that Mary will become pregnant through the Holy Spirit, that God will put the child in her womb, confirming that her baby will, in fact, be the Christ, Emmanuel, the Son of God. He then adds that Mary's cousin Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist, even though she is in her old age and has been considered barren her entire life, noting that nothing with God is impossible. When Mary challenges the plausibility of her pregnancy, and understandably so, she says, well, how's that supposed to be? I'm a virgin. Gabriel simply reminds Mary that this is God we're talking about here. Sure, by the world's standards, yes, it is impossible. There is no way that you could carry the Son of God if you're a virgin, except if you add in the supernatural, which is the power of God. Right? If you add in God to the equation, all bets are off. And so he, he adds, you know, he, he, he challenges her questioning. Not that she's questioning in a way, I don't want this. She's just simply saying, how? And he says, don't you know the God that we're talking about? He can do all things according to His will. There is nothing that God cannot do. And most strikingly, Mary then responds that she is the servant of the Lord, and so let it be according to His word, and Gabriel departs. And I just have to say, if only we had that amount of faith that Mary did. This young girl, unmarried with her entire life ahead of her, one of the lowest people in the hierarchical standings of society, finds herself chosen by God to do His will, knowing that there's challenge ahead because she's supposed to be a virgin. She's betrothed to Joseph. She knows that this is going to make everything seem messy, at the very least from the outside perspective. Right? How How is she supposed to explain it to Joseph, who she's betrothed to, let alone everybody else? Oh, no. No, I'm a virgin still. Wait, what? How does that work? What do you mean? You must have laid with Joseph. That's going to be the assumption society is going to make. Or, even worse, not even your betrothed, but somebody else. And so even with all of that looming before her, she says, Here I am, God. Do with me according to your will. See, we often today get scared because God's will for us is to share the gospel to just talk to people, and we turn down God's opportunities with fickle excuses. Mary here is willed by God to carry the Son of God in her womb, God incarnate, Jesus Christ. And then she has to raise this boy into a man who then she has to watch be crucified. This is no small task. And yet Mary says, here I am, Lord. Do with me according to your will. See, I could get into it more this morning and, and really rail all of us about what, it, what it's supposed to be and how we're supposed to act and how we should be responding, but that doesn't exactly line up with the idea of rejoicing, right? And so I'm not going to just sit and bear down on us about our um, shortcomings in regard to to what God calls us to in life. I want our focus instead this morning to to be on the happy and joyful advent of Christ. The birth of our Savior. So perhaps instead it would be wise that in light of what we've read so far, we should simply challenge ourselves with joy to do what God calls us to to wake up each morning and pray to have the obedience that Mary had. To wake up each morning and pray, yes, Lord, here I am. Do with me according to your will. 
Let's continue reading in verse 39. So Gabriel has departed from Mary, and then it says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. I really love this story. I think it's such an amazing story to read through. We're reading about two of the um, lowest, I'm putting some quotes on that, right? Two of the lowest people in society at the time. being tasked with some of the most important jobs you possibly could be given. Elizabeth, an aged woman, childless and without that future, right, without the assurance of a child who will continue on, who will care for her, right? They didn't have um, social security back then. Your social security is your children. You trusted that when I'm too old to be able to take care of myself, my children will take care of me and continue on. And so without all of that, Here's Elizabeth, and God says, here's John the Baptist. You're going to give birth to the man who's going to proclaim. He's going to be the voice in the wilderness that says, here comes the Christ. And then you have Mary, this young virgin, pregnant outside of wedlock, and she's carrying Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Both of these women receive God's calling, and they're obedient. They're obedient to the calling that God has for them. And so it says, when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, John jumps in Elizabeth's womb for joy. Now, I'm never going to know what that feels like to have a baby move inside of me, period. But I wonder what it feels like to have a baby leap for joy inside a mother's womb. It must be kind of shocking, I would think. And it says that, that when... John jumps in her womb. It says that she's filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit speaks through her and acknowledges and rejoices in the opportunity to be a witness of God coming to earth through Mary. And so I want to kind of dwell on that for a moment. The idea of God coming to earth. God incarnate. Right? Because that's what Elizabeth is rejoicing about. That God would come down to earth. That God would make himself lower in that sense and come down to meet with us. See, we live in a world that says that God's not real, that God doesn't exist. And they say that if God was real, then there wouldn't be any bad things that happen in this world. And there's a whole sermon that I could go into to try to answer that. But instead, I I, want to get to the root of that questioning, which is a misunderstanding of good and evil and a misunderstanding of the love of God. The world says that to love someone, it means you accept, you agree, you encourage one's choices, even if those choices are immoral, unjust, and sinful. And so that's, that's the premise of everything going on in our world today, right? They say that the Christian thing to do is just love people the way they are, which for them means we have to 100% agree with everything that they do. That, of course, is not love. The loving thing to do is, in gentleness, confront the sin and immorality which the world sees as rejection. But what we see here in Christ's birth is the greatest example of what love truly is. See, God looks at us in our sin, in our immorality, in our disobedience, and He says, I love you. And He looks at us and He says, I love you so much that I'm going to come down to you. I'm going to step down from my position as God to be among you. And I'm going to sacrifice my son so that you don't have to die the death that you deserve. See, love isn't saying, oh, I accept you in your sin. It's saying, you're in sin. How do we get out of it? What can we do to ensure that you don't continue in that sin? Right? Love requires some correction along the way. If it didn't, why did all of us have to come to Christ, right? We come to Christ because we're in our sin and we realize that sin. We're made aware of that sin. 
And God says, well, here's a way to rectify the situation. And that way is God incarnate. That way is Jesus. What's more is that not only does, Je- or not only does God come to us here on earth, but he comes to us in the most humble of ways. A humble baby, born of a virgin, in a stable in the town of Bethlehem. And God chooses two women of low status to bring this message. He could have had Jesus be born through a king, through somebody else, through someone of great status. Jesus could have just come on his own. But none of that would have allowed what God needed. God needed the perfect sacrifice. God needed Jesus to be fully God and fully man here on earth to live a perfect life so that he would have the perfect sacrifice for us. And so seeing all of this, it actually should be a great encouragement to us. None of us in this room, no offense, is all that special compared to the person next to us, right? And I'm not saying that to try to be offensive to any of us, right? Is someone in here secretly famous that I don't know about? Some celebrity that walked through the doors this morning? I mean, we're all just each other. Now, we're all special to each other, right? We all love and care about each other. I'm not trying to say we're not. But we're very much like Mary and Elizabeth. There is nothing so special about us that says, well, of course, Evan. Oh, well, of course, Marvin. Oh, well, of course, Rick. Right? There's nothing so special in that manner. We're all just sinners who have come to know who Jesus is, accepted him as Lord and Savior, and now here we are every Sunday to worship God and give thanks. See, God tends to use the lowest of lows. God tends to use the people that have the lower status. Right? God uses Joseph, the youngest brother at the time, who ended up a slave and then a prisoner, who ends up eventually saving all of Egypt. God uses Gideon, who's the, from the weakest in Manasseh. God uses Samson, a man who seems to fail more often than he succeeds. God uses Moses, the man with a stud, stutter, <laughs> that was a good timing, the man with a stutter to set the Israelites free. God uses David, a young shepherd boy, to defeat Goliath. God uses Ruth with nothing but her name to her. See, I could go on and on about how God is not afraid to use the little people for big things. That extends to us as well. I don't know how big the things are that God has in store for each of us, but God has a plan for each of us, and there's things for us to do according to His will. And there's no status that says, well, what you're, you, you're so great that God has to give you something even greater to do than everybody else. And this is a perfect example. What was so special about Mary? Except that God chose Mary. And so for that, we should, we should respond with obedience like Mary. And we should respond and rejoice like Elizabeth at the opportunity to be a part of God's great plan, right? That's part of what Elizabeth is saying. Who am I that I would get to be here and stand and have a conversation with the Lord's mother? And as Gabriel said, nothing will be impossible with God. Elizabeth understands that. Mary understands that. We should understand that too. There is nothing that God cannot do. And so after Elizabeth speaks over Mary through the Holy Spirit, I love Mary's response because she's overwhelmed with joy and she breaks out in song. I want to read that now, verse 46 And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. 
He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So she begins her song and she's, sorry, I didn't sing it all for you guys, but she begins her song saying that she magnifies the Lord and she rejoices in God, her Savior. This is a a declarative song that you might have noticed is in majority speaking in the past tense. These are things that Mary knows to be true, whether, it's, whether she is singing about things that have already happened or if she simply understands that these are things that will happen because she knows, as Gabriel said, nothing will be impossible with God. And so she, you know, she's singing and she says, God's looked on the humble estate of his servant. He has done great things for me. He's shown strength with his arm and has scattered the proud. He's brought down the mighty. He exalts the humble. He has filled the hungry. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel. Mary sees Christ as the Messiah, even if at the time she's got the, the slightly skewed understanding of what the Messiah would totally look like. She understood the power that this child would one day wield. She understood the importance of the task that God had given to her. And she rejoices. She rejoices so greatly she can't help but sing. That's all she knows to do in the moment. She's pleased and considers herself blessed to be the one that God chose to use. And she declares the victory that God will have through Jesus. Much of what Mary sings here is an echo of Scripture. and I could go through it all and I, we'd have to spend a lot more time. But just to give a few references, in verse 48, it refers back to Psalm 138, 6. Or verse 49 goes back to Psalm 71, 19. Psalm 126, 2. And Psalm 90, 99, 3. Verse, four, verse 51, all these numbers are jumbling on my sheet here, sorry. Verse 51 reflects Psalm 89, 10 and Psalm 98, 1. Verse 53 reflects Psalm 107, 9. Now they're not verbatim, I'm not expecting you to go. If you go and look it up, don't expect them to match perfectly. But the message being shared through these words. These are all things that Mary knows to be true, that she can trust to be true. I think there's something so beautiful about just reading through this song and understanding that this is the cry of Mary's heart. This was her response to what God intends to do through her. Mary, so moved by the works of God, bursts out in song, declaring His majesty his glory, and his victory, proclaiming that God has done great things for her by blessing her to be the mother of Christ. And as we read something like this, we should ask ourselves, when God gives us something to do, does our soul magnify the Lord? Is my response to God's calling to praise God, to thank God for what's ahead, Mary certainly knew that there would be challenges with what God is asking of her. To raise a child, that alone is enough work, right? I mean, praise to all you moms out there. You guys do a fantastic job, something I could never do. Mary knows the challenge ahead of her, and her response is to break out in song and praise God, and to rejoice. And so we should be asking ourselves, every time that God calls us to something, am I going to rejoice in this moment, or am I going to be downtrodden because God called me to to share the gospel with that guy that just gets on my nerves? Or that person that I'm afraid, if I share with them that I go to church every week and that they should come with me, they might not want to be my friend anymore. They might ostracize me and cast me away from from their friendship. Are we allowing what we want 
to prevent us from rejoicing. We should be rejoicing. We should be glad. We should be grateful every time that God says, hey, you, I want you to do something for me. What an honor it should be to us to to be called by God and to say, God wants me to do this for him. God finds me capable of doing what he needs done. God believes that I can do this with him. Praise God. That should be our response. See, Mary knows the challenges and she says, I trust God to provide for me, to take care of me, to ensure that I can do what he has willed me to do. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 23 through 29, they say, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. See, in her song, Mary ascribes to the Lord glory and strength. She ascribes to the Lord the glory due his name. And she worships the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Why should our, our souls magnify the Lord? The answer is pretty simple. Because he has done great things. Not only has he done great things for us, but he's just done great things, plain and simple. You know, a, a number of weeks ago, we had a sermon on gratitude. On having an attitude of gratitude. And the focus that morning was that when all else fails, regardless of what may be going on in our lives, no matter how good or bad our life may be going, according to our um, understanding, we still have, at a bare minimum, a reason to be thankful, and that reason is God. God loves us so much that He came down to us not to condemn us, but to save us. And in response, there's, there's two ways we can live. Either we can live for ourselves each day, waking up and pursuing the things of the world, or, and this is the better way, right? We could pursue holiness and righteousness such that we would give all the glory and honor to God. Such that we would wake up each morning and we would rejoice for the day that God has made. See, we're here to call everyone to grow together into the abundant life of Christ. If that's how we want to live, if that's what we want, we need to live each day for the glory of God. Not for the glory of heaven, not for the glory of ourselves, not for the glory of whatever we want, whatever the world wants, but for the glory of God. See, I think the world would be a different place if every Christian woke up every morning and said, what am I doing today to further the glory of God, to further God's kingdom? What am I going to do today that will bring all glory to God. And to do it with rejoicing, with gladness, with appreciation, just for the opportunity to be used by God. See, we should be waking up each day with our souls magnifying the Lord because He and He alone has done great things for us. And so let us rejoice with gladness And praise God for what he has done and continues to do for us each and every day. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that you have done great things. Not only for us, but Lord, the great things we read of in Scripture. Lord, we're so thankful that you've given us your word to reveal to us so much about you to reveal to us your great plan to bring salvation to the world through Christ. Father, we can't thank you enough for that. We rejoice in that. In the fact that you love the world so much. You love each and every one of us so much. 
that you sent Jesus into this world to bring salvation. Heavenly Father, we pray that that as we go today, that we would rejoice, that our souls would magnify you. Because, Father, you have done great things. Lord, we thank you and we pray this in your name. Amen.